I am Umesh Kadam. I work as a regional legal advisor for International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, currently, I am based in Nairobi, uh, working for East and uh, Horn of Africa. Uh, as far as the relationship between ICRC and ICTR is concerned, it goes back uh, when the tribunal was established. And uh, it started mainly in the area of visiting people who were detained in relation to their trials. And ICRC has um, this mandate to visit people who are deprived of liberty. It's one of the traditional activities of the ICRC, which are carried out by the organization throughout the world. And in relation to the tribunal, the people who were apprehended, who were detained or who were undergoing trials, they were visited here in Arusha in the United Nations uh, detention facility. But those who were convicted by the tribunal and those who are now serving their sentences in different countries, we also have access to, to them. So uh, the ICRC could carry out this activity in accordance with its modalities and practices, which are well established over the last several years. And we have had a very constructive and frank relationship with the ICTR because at the end of visits to detention facilities, um, the findings of the visits are shared on a confidential basis with the detaining authorities. And we have had a very frank conversation with the authorities of the ICTR and we have received excellent cooperation from these authorities. So that goes back to, so the first visit was in 1996. 1996 was yeah. your first visit. First visit to United Nations Detention Facility. Tell me about yeah. that. What, what was that like? Well, I was not involved in that. But as I said, uh, there are specialized delegates of ICRC who are trained in uh, visiting uh, places of detention just to, to see uh, the conditions of detention and the treatment given to people who are detained. And uh, that is done in accordance with the well-established practices to see that uh, all these standards are respected. What, what are some of the things that you're most proud of in terms of contributions that have been made uh, by your organization to the, how the ICTR operates? Well, ICRC is uh, not taking part in any proceedings as such. In fact, um, at the, in the international criminal law, there is one principle which is well established and that is uh, that is to be found in the Rome Statute on International Criminal Court that ICRC delegates cannot be compelled to testify in international trials because of the confidential character and because of the, in many situations, the sensitive information that we may have. And ICRC would like to maintain its uh, absolute neutrality and impartiality and in view of that, uh, ICRC's, uh, this role is recognized and ICRC is uh, immune from testifying. But our areas of uh, collaboration, as I said earlier, uh, visiting places of detention is one thing, but also outreach and promotion of international humanitarian law, international criminal law. As you probably know, ICRC is considered as the guardian of international humanitarian law. And from that point of view, creation of ICTR as such was a landmark event for us because um, international humanitarian law violations, along with other violations which happened in uh, Rwanda, and the people who were most responsible for these were held accountable. So it is important from the point of view of ensuring respect to international humanitarian law that those who are guilty of serious violations, they are held accountable. So this mechanism, this process of holding people accountable was important for us and we have watched with keen interest how the tribunal has addressed these uh, issues, how uh, it interpreted international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and I must say here that the contribution of ICTR to articulation, promotion, development of humanitarian law as well as international criminal law in general is unparalleled, along with, uh, we can say, the sister tribunal for former Yugoslavia. So uh, there are many areas in international criminal law which were clarified and further articulated. New notions were established through the judicial interpretation and through the, the decisions of the tribunal. So for, for us, as a guardian of humanitarian law, that is one area. 
So, so far as the outreach and promotion of international humanitarian law is concerned, the ICRC's Nairobi delegation started working closely with the tribunal since the year 2000. And what we do is we established, we started an all Africa moot competition for students from English speaking countries of Africa. And this is done annually every year since the year 2000 and it is supported strongly by ICTR. And what we do is we bring together teams of students from uh, many African countries and they stay in Arusha for one week and we have training in international humanitarian law, international criminal law uh, for, for uh, almost every day in the mornings. But in the afternoons they compete in different role play scenarios so that they, they are given different roles. Uh, sometimes they they play the role of a rebel leader. Sometimes, like a minister in the minister in in some country, or uh, some NGO professionals who are working on humanitarian issues. So they have to bring out humanitarian law issues through their role play, and we develop the case study in such a way that the final round of the competition it ends up in some tribunal. A kind of ad hoc tribunal. It's all fictitious. The case study is all fictitious. And, but we design it in such a way that the last round is like a court proceedings and it takes place and it took place uh, until recently in the main courtroom of ICTR. In fact, we finished this competition some 10 days back here in Arusha. And we always have uh, the, the in most of the competition rounds, the, the president of ICT are sitting, presiding over the final round along with some other judges. But we, uh, in Arusha, we also have other judicial institutions like the African Court of Human and People's Rights, East African Court of Justice, the High Court of Tanzania. So we started involving judges from these institutions as well. So it's, uh, it's something which is going on for last 15 years. And we receive excellent collaboration from ICTR. And we have already discussed the possibility of continuation of uh, this competition in collaboration with MICT. In fact, our uh, other activities that I mentioned, you know, visiting people who are detained, that, that will continue as long as people are subject to detention. And we will be, we have already started working with MICT. And we hope to work uh, with MICT in the same spirit of collaboration and mutual understanding, which has marked the relationship between ICRC and ICTR. So these, these visits, these are visits to monitor the conditions, conditions of detention and treatment. Why, why is that important? Well, uh, you see, traditionally it started in relation to visiting prisoners of war in international armed conflict because their condition is quite vulnerable. And there are possibilities of ill treatment, torture, extrajudicial killings, disappearances. So this uh, mandate of ICRC is to be found in the third Geneva Convention of 1949, where ICRC is given this responsibility to visit places where, peop uh, where prisoners of war are held. Prisoners of war are taken always in international armed conflict. Combatants who are detained, enemy combatants, they get prisoner of war status. But the situation is not the same in relation to non-international conflict. Those who are detained in relation to non-international conflict or let me say participation in a non-international conflict, if they are detained, then they do not get the prisoner of war status. They are simply detainees or people whom we may say people deprived of liberty in relation to an armed conflict. So ICRC developed this practice of visiting those people as well on purely humanitarian grounds to see that they are well treated, they are well respected because there are humanitarian law standards of treatment, how the people have to be treated. These standards are to be found in humanitarian law instruments, customary international humanitarian law. And uh, this uh, role of ICRC is universally acknowledged as a neutral, impartial humanitarian organization, which is in most situations of uh, non-international armed conflicts given access 
Now, if it's an international armed conflict, the ICRC has a right to visit prisoners of war. But that's not the same case in relation to non-international armed conflict. We have to seek permission from the detaining authorities, the state authorities in most of the cases where people are detained by the, the, the state authorities. And in most situations of conflict, ICRC is given access, and this role of ICRC is universally acknowledged. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, in relation to ICTR as well, you know, the same uh, approach is being followed. We we initially established contact with ICTR and uh, asked for access, and we were given access uh, in recognition of our role as a neutral, impartial humanitarian organization. And since then, we have had a very uh, fruitful relationship with the, with the tribunal. Um, in terms of the legacy of the tribunal, I mean, we, we have to acknowledge that uh, through large number of judicial decisions, the, the tribunal has very significantly contributed to the growth of international criminal law as well as international humanitarian law. As um, it was mentioned during um, the events which have happened yesterday and today, uh, the definition of genocide, that uh, sexual violence can be one way in which genocide can be perpetrated, then even holding civilians accountable for war crimes was was an issue which has been clarified by the by the tribunal then again uh, the role of media in genocide so these are some of the areas which um, have very significantly contributed to the uh, clarification and growth of international criminal law but there is one other area which is quite significant um, in terms of international criminal justice system and that is the end of impunity People who hold important positions, they can be held accountable. And this um, fight against impunity is one of the missions of the, the tribunal, and it has very significantly contributed. Now, what is important, again, is uh, international criminal law is growing at the national level as well. What I want to mean by growth of international criminal law at the national level is many countries are adopting legislations, national legislations, to prosecute international crimes in their domestic jurisdictions. And the countries have, I mean, I can give you some examples of from the region like Uganda or Kenya, where they have national legislations which say that war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide are punishable offenses in the domestic legal systems. So uh, in Uganda, for example, there is an international crimes division of the High Court of Uganda and currently they are prosecuting certain criminals for international crimes. So we have to look at this growth in international criminal law. It's not only confined to international level, it has impact at the national level as well. And, um, and the tribunal has uh, taken initiative to build capacity of national legal professionals, including the judiciary, to develop expertise in international criminal law. It's apart from the judicial function of the tribunal. It's like outreach and capacity building, like prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, they are being trained and there were large, I mean, there are quite a few uh, training programs, which at least I know personally, which have happened in Arusha jointly with the, with the tribunal and uh, High Court of uh, the Supreme Court of uh, Tanzania, but not only for Tanzanian judges, bringing together judges from other countries, legal professionals, prosecutors. So uh, this contribution of the tribunal to, the, to, to further um, development of international criminal law is quite significant. So the tribunal cannot be looked upon simply as a judicial body which is given a responsibility to adjudicate on legal issues. It has made a contribution uh, in, in development of criminal law building capacity. Even I gave you the example of the moot competition the students you know who 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 take part in this they are so inspired 
that many of them select international law as their career and they specialize in international criminal law as well and many have today become professionals in this field so uh, we look at it uh, the, as the legacy of the tribunal from different angles different perspectives and different contributions of the tribunal judicial function is one thing holding people accountable excellent work has been done but contribution to international criminal justice system building the capacity development of international criminal law these are other areas where the the tribunal has uh, very significantly contributed to the whole process